Hi, Kevin Ledoux, Ledoux Guitars. I'm back again today because uh, someone submitted a question in my comments section on my channel. They wanted to know how do you determine the arc of a radius dish? If you want to make one, how do you how do you get that arc? And that was that's a good question because I think there's a lot of videos out there um, that show you how to do this, but I'm not sure that they tell you how to arrive or how to lay out that radius to, to make the tracks to do this. In order to make your own radius dish, you have to make your own tools to make the dish. That's where this is important. So today I'm going to try and answer that. The question is, the problem we're going to solve here today is given the radius that you're going to create in your dish, what is the maximum distance that that radius drops down across a 24 inch span? We want to know how far is it from here to a line straight across there. I've drawn a diagram here uh, to help display what I did and how I go through these calculations. The first thing I did was I drew an arc representing the radius of the dish that I want to create. In this case, 40 feet. Uh, I have drawn a cord across that, and the cord length is 24 inches because that's the diameter of the disc that I want to create. And I selected that diameter, of course, because it fits the diameter of the sanding discs that are available to do this. Uh, from there, I put a bisector on that cord, which means, of course, that it's not only at the center of the cord, but it's also at 90 degrees to it. And that bisector is a radius of the circle. So we know that this is 40 feet. And therefore, we know if we draw a line from that center point to one end of the cord, we know that that's also a radius at 40 feet converted here to inches, both of these, uh, 480 inches. And that means now that among the two sides and half of that cord, I have a right triangle. So I have an A, B, and a C side. And I'm sure you can guess we're going toward the Pythagorean theorem, and that's exactly where we're going. So since I know that both line A and both C are 480 inches long, I took the square of those, which is 230, or excuse me, 230,400. So now we have that information. I also took the square of this half cord, half of the cord is 12, so therefore its squared value is 144. And now we're gonna plug that information in to a couple of simple calculations to find distance DE. So we move from the explanation to the actual arithmetic part of this. Not too hard. As I mentioned, we'd be going to the Pythagorean theorem, uh, a squared plus b squared equals c squared. I'm sure a lot of you are very familiar with that. Um, hope I'm not preaching to the choir or being redundant or insulting here. Uh, but as a result of this logic, that means that a squared equals c squared minus b squared. So we plug in the numbers. a squared is 230,400 minus b squared, which is 144, and we get a result of 230,256. So if we calculate the square root of 230,256, we get 479.84, which is the length of line A. Now we'll, whoops, sorry for the vibration. We'll go back over here and we'll refer to this line A. But keep in mind that this length that we've just calculated is from the cord to the center point of that circle. It does not include distance DE. But fear not, here we go. We do know that the length of that radius is 480 inches. So if we tr subtract 479.84, this being the length of line A in the triangle, 
the result that we get from that, D minus E, back again over here, right? Uh, we get 16 hundredths inches, okay? Just as simple as can be. Any review? Any questions? Anybody want to raise their hand? All right. Let's move on to the next step because now that we got all of this wonderful information, what the hell do you do with this stuff? And I'm prepared to demonstrate how I affected this actually on a piece of material. So in order to actually make the dish with the proper radius in it, you need to make a pair of tracks that a router is going to follow. Um, I made a video on making a radius dish. Um, I believe it's still in my, in my channel. Uh, I did it a long, long time ago. But there are other videos that use this same technique using a router in this track system. So there's plenty of instruction out there. Um, but, of course, what we really wanted to find out is what is that maximum offset at the, at the center of 24 inches. This is a 15 foot radius. And I, I chose this and the stuff that I have so that you could see just how severe that curve is. That's, you know, by the time you get down to a 15 foot radius, that's quite a drop. So to make these up, you can do it with a real thick piece of wood, uh, glue these together, glue it up if you need to, or find a thick piece, doesn't really matter. And you lay it out once um, lay out the curve, cut it on your bandsaw, and then rip it open so that the curves are exactly the same. Uh, but you could also lay this out, as I'm demonstrating here. I used a piece of MDF. It could be half inch or a quarter inch plywood. I don't suppose it matters. You could make yourself a pattern to trace on your material from there. And if you're careful in all of your layouts and your tracing, you're, you're going to be just fine. So the first thing I did was selected a piece of, of material that is clearly more than 24 inches long. And then I just took a 24-inch rule and I laid it on here and made the edges of the rule or the edge of the rule and the edge of the MDF uh, coincide. And I marked a zero point and marked 24 inches at the other end because that's easier than measuring, especially when the, when the uh, scale is exactly 24 inches long. Uh, the next thing I did was I drew a line parallel to that edge. You, know, you could just trace the opposite side of your 24-inch scale if you wanted to. Um, you could lay that out any way you want, as long as this line is parallel to the edge of your MDF. The next thing I did was at my 24-inch marks, I use these pins. Now, these are just standard pins that I use for any number of purposes of alignment and so on. But you find a pin that you want to use and you want something that works out that is a, is a fraction of an inch uh, so that you can match a drill to it. I suppose you could even use a drill and then if you happen to have two of them, then you could place one of uh, a drill in each hole. But what I did was this is eighth of an inch, and so right on that line, I moved back a sixteenth of an inch and put a center point and drilled it. And I did the same thing at the other end. Okay, that's simple enough. Then I took those over and drilled them on the drill press. Now you should drill these on a the drill press because you do want them nice and straight up and down. They, they want to be strictly square with the surface of your work. All right, so I'm going to put the camera down because I need two hands and I'm going to see if I can show you how I did the rest of this. Keep in mind that these pins are 20, they're 24 inches apart and they are set back from that parallel line by one half their distance so that this edge, you might say, or this point of tangency is right on that line. So the next thing I did was I take a steel rod. Now, you would be better off if you can find some eighth by eighth inch. I don't recommend anything much over eighth by eighth because it's just going to be too stiff. I don't have anything like that in stock. So 
I used a nice piece of steel rod. I wouldn't recommend aluminum. Uh, brass might be all right, but uh, a steel rod or a steel square stock is going to be easy to get. And of course, it needs to be more than 24 inches long. So I don't know if you can see this clearly enough. I'm going to move the camera so that you can see how I position this like so and like so. And what I'm going to do is push right there. So I'm going to turn you around and see if we can focus right on what I'm doing here. And as you, as you can see, I've already done this. I wanted to rehearse before I perform. And all I'm going to do is shove that to this mark. Well, what is that mark? That mark is the distance that I calculated, 16 hundredths of an inch. So I, I measured from this line to a point here at 16 hundredths of an inch. I placed my rod. I nudged that over with my finger. And you want to do that right in the center, not over here. You do that right in the center, and you trace that line. Yep, and you got to hold it steadily and all of that stuff. That's important. And this is why I said a piece of square stock would be a little better because it's not going to allow your pencil to tilt on you. But there you have now your curved line. So from this view, maybe you can see that curved line a little better. And you can see that mark that I made there, 16 hundredths of an inch from my original mark that was parallel to the edge of the MDF. So this is not really hard to do. Now, from here, of course, you're going to take this and you're going to run this over your bandsaw or you, if even if you have a handheld jigsaw, you could cut that line. The idea is to sneak up on it. Don't try to cut right to the line. Sneak up on it. Cut close and then use rasps, files, scrapers, whatever you need, sanding equipment um, to perfect that. And you're going to use uh, you're going to use the whole curve, perfect it just the very best that you can. Um, and you can do it. You'd be surprised how accurately you can come. Now, my lines, I've made quite dark. I've gone over them a, a couple of times, and I've made them quite dark so that they would be visible on camera. If you were doing this, I would recommend, you know, I use a half millimeter lead, or if you want to be even more precise, do this with a knife. And those lines will be extremely precise. So when you're all done with this layout and the cutting and the refining, you can end up with this or something very similar to it with the appropriate arc refined in it. And as you see here, this is only a quarter of an inch thick, but it could be three quarter thick or half or whatever you want it to be. And I even find that it's really handy to keep these around because you can trace them here and there wherever you might need them, or you can rebuild your tracks if someday you ever need to. Now, the point of this, of course, is to make a pair of tracks like these. These will be set in a frame uh, at such a distance that a router is trapped right here and cannot move either way. And as it travels across the disk, um, the disk will be fastened underneath on a pin so that it can rotate and there you go it will it will cut that radius for you beautifully um, it's it's not too hard to do if you use this method where you have a pattern and you trace it out uh, as opposed to laying out directly on your work then it would be important to use thick enough material of course so that you can make this in one piece and then rip it open. But it's important that your tracing or your layout be nicely parallel. I'm not having success here because I'm working one-handed, folks. Um, but you can see my starting point here is right on the edge. My starting point here is on the edge. Or you could use a piece such that you line up more precisely even with that back edge and then trace that and cut it out.
the important thing is that you do this in thick enough material so that you can rip out one of these, refine your curve, and then rip it open to have identical tracks. Now I know somebody's going to get particular and they're likely to argue the precision of what I've just shown you. Uh, the mathematical precision is irrefutable, but the question of course is, can you lay that out and cut that as perfectly as the arithmetic or the mathematics says that it should be? And the answer is obviously not. Um, but here's the important thing. If you're making guitars, you're not manufacturing and you're not doing uh, dozens of lots in different departments or any of that kind of stuff. So if you have a nice refined curve in your processing so that you are making a consistently curved radius dish, it really doesn't matter if when you aimed for 40 feet, if the radius is actually 41 feet or it's 39 feet, and believe me, you're going to be able to come that close. But even if you missed it by a couple of feet, I don't think that really is going to be a big deciding factor between failure and success. What is the deciding factor is the consistency. You, make, you want to make sure that your finished dish doesn't have lumps and bumps in it. You just want it to be nicely consistent. And that's very, very achievable. And the nice part about all of that is that you can then use that. Now you have um, a base for your radius. You have that established. So now if you wanted to make, for example, I use these radiusing uh, jigs on a shaper to put a radius on my braces. Well, you're not only going to lay out that curve, maybe with this template, you might lay that out, but you're also going to take that edge after you've cut it on a bandsaw, and you're going to take that right over there to your radius dish, and you're going to sand that curve to refine it on that dish. And you can also make blocks like these, which you put these together and you put those over on that radius dish and you sand those. This is a 25 foot dome. Is it exactly 25 feet? Probably not exactly, but the point is it matches the domed or the radius dish that I made. It matches it because I made it there. That's when you get, you can achieve the consistency that you need to make your guitars, your plates and, and things come together. And, uh, you, you know, your braces are going to match the top that you want. It's, it's all going to work together. And when you have something like this, then your bridge is going to lay down on that top because it matches everything else that it's supposed to. I've made a video on making these, making these tracks and making uh, a radius dish. Uh, I don't remember, I may have deleted it because it was a very old video and it really, the photo quality and, and video quality was pretty poor. But there are others that are just excellent at doing the same process. So there you have it. Um, I hope this has been useful to you and I hope this has helped you um, figure out how to determine just how that curve works or how to lay that curve out for your own work. As you know, I encourage you to make all of the tooling for yourself that you can. Because when you make your own tooling, you are the master of that tooling and you can manipulate it, change it, rebuild it, and you have no umbilical cord between you and all of those suppliers that I really hate to love. So I am the Pragmatic Luthier, Kevin Ledoux. Please put a like on the video, subscribe to my channel if you have not, and best of luck in your guitar making. Thanks for watching.